Well, welcome to the show. Today, I get to chat with, I would say debate, but we'll tell you why we're not going to use that word. I get to chat with Corey. Corey, how are you today? I'm doing good. I like the work you put out, man. You're always putting out content every day, almost, it looks like. And, and like me too, I'm <laughs> trying my best. And we're both putting out the content, sharing the word of voluntarism. I think these ideas are going to get massively big, by the way, just continually every single year. They already are. <laughs> They're good ideas, I think. So yeah, yeah. they should. <laughs> yeah, I mean, absolutely. Yeah. People are like, man, we already live like this most of our life. Why don't we apply this to everything? And it works. Yeah, you know? yeah. Well, Corey and I talked before the show about uh, usually on a on a podcast, you kind of go over what you're going to talk about beforehand and kind of rules and that kind of stuff. But then we thought, you know what? We both kind of like being nice guys and not mean and in your face. So not only are we not going to debate, but we're just going to talk about, hey, what are your rules of conversation and what are rules and what are preferences? And then we either agree to go by them or not. And either which way, I think that the good thing about today's show is that we are going to focus on the things that we disagree about because the things we do agree about, that's boring. We already agree. We're, mm -hmm. we're both 100% right on the stuff we agree about. <laughs> so it's those areas um, that we don't agree about that we want to focus on. And I think the big overarching, overarching thing is that we both kind of think that no matter which of us was right before we started the show today, and no matter what we think a week from now, do we both agree that we're not going to initiate violence against the other? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And I, and I think if we agree with that, then we can pretty much say, okay, we agree 90% otherwise, or 20%, or 2%, or no percent otherwise. But hey, man, keep yourself over on your side of the fence. I'll keep myself here. And, you know, that'll be that. So, I, and which is a perfectly acceptable human interaction. It's not my preference. I like having friends, but, you know, that would work too. So, <laughs> Corey reached out to me when I did a recent uh, video, uh, or I don't even think it was a video. It was a uh, one of my fallacy series, logical fallacies about uh, the nature fallacy. Um, in which I said, hey, nature is sometimes good, sometimes it's bad, but to say that it, because something is natural, it is therefore good, um, that's wrong. And Corey responded and said, eh, I kind of like nature and it's <laughs> pretty much always good, but I don't want to put words in your mouth. Mm -hmm. What is your definition of nature? Like what is and what isn't nature and, and so on? Well, if we can look at the definition of nature, and well, I guess it would depend on what nature you're talking about. It could be human nature. It could be the nature you refer to as the trees, the environment. It could be the nature of any one thing. So within that environment, a human being, a glass has a nature. I mean, everything we say has a nature. So we can say that is nature's with an S. And then there's nature, which is everything, right? Everything nature. And so um, I like to first classify that macro worldview, which is nature without the S, and then the micro, which is nature's that are within. So that's how I typically look at nature. But if you look at the definition, you're going to get among variations of that. So it's going to be birth, condition, constitution, um, you know, inherent qualities, inherent characteristics, uh, essential qualities, initial. And, and I think some of these words have very powerful meanings as they've been used throughout history. And unfortunately, I think they've also been used throughout history to deceive people and bring people toward certain ways of thinking. And I think that's where the nature fallacy, when it's actually used as a fallacy, may come in. I'm not denying that that may be an actual fallacy. I am saying, however, that there is a side to it which is not fallacious, and that requires knowledge. To me, knowledge is the key of everything. As Socrates said, the only good is knowledge, the only evil is ignorance. So for me, nature is good in so far as it is known. Nature, you cannot have a concept of nature without knowledge. So knowledge is the prerequisite. If I think when I think about nature, and I don't want to go for the I don't want to fall for the dictionary fallacy, which is some dude sometime wrote something on some <laughs> paper and his name was Webster, so therefore he is forevermore right. right. So there are probably 
few hundred thousand or a couple million definitions of nature mm -hmm. uh, or natural in the world. So, and when I look at it from a lay perspective, and please correct me as we go along, because I have not looked into it that much. Sure. I think of if I'm walking down the through the woods and I see a stick, I go, ah, that's natural. And then I see a beer bottle and I go, ah, that's not natural. <laughs> now, it is kind of natural, though, because humans mm. are natural and mm. glass came from everything came from nature. Like mm -hmm. we, we're not getting something from elsewhere. So right. then every physical thing would somewhat be natural, even yes. artificial sweetener. Um, yes, absolutely. So what isn't natural? If we're going to if if you are saying nature is really cool, things natural are really cool, then what wouldn't fit within that category? Well, what's funny is you even admitted it to, as an example yourself, because you can't really escape it. You said, here's a beer bottle, it's unnatural compared to the stick, even though you said, oh, wait, it still comes from nature. So you recognize there's a source, there's an origin through which everything came from, but you realize that one came way later on created by humans, whereas one other thing was not created by humans that has always been there. So I usually use the distinction of time uh, to tell all truth, essentially. So if the stick just fell a week ago and the beer bottle was there a year ago, the beer bottle has seniority. No. Okay. It's in the nature of the stick that it belongs to the universe. It's not in the nature of the beer bottle. It's a form that has been created out of other things in nature, um, twisted out of their original form into something that we now have a new word for, beer bottle. You know, like we wouldn't have this word if we didn't have this new thing to identify. So if I look over to the side of the trail beside the beer bottle and the stick, and I see that there's a, an aspen tree there, and a deer has been rubbing on it and shaving the, the bark off the outside with its antlers, that is something that a, a critter uh, that's natural, just like a human is natural, has through its productive labor, <laughs> probably not intentionally, but it has created some cool stripes on a tree. Mm -hmm. That aspen right next to another aspen tree is one more natural than the other? Is the one that the deer scraped less natural or are they equally natural? This is why I ask people questions because... What you're saying right now, I would probably like, and I'm not going to go down that route because I don't want it to be like, okay, well, I'm going to ask you a question after you just ask me a question. Because, But it, that's kind of how I want to approach yeah, it. Please do. It's really, <laughs> yeah, please do. like, well, like, what do you think? Because the thing is, is like, okay, here's an animal doing its change, which we are always going to change. We're always going to create an impact. I'm not saying humans should not commit any action we're always going to have a footprint right that's that's a good thing but maybe there's a question as to that very action not just to the existence so i have a common phrase for naturosophy you know my philosophy about natures which is just because something is natural to exist does not mean it is natural to use okay and also just because something is natural to occur does not mean it's natural to exist so these are separate scenarios that would have to be addressed and so i that answers their question if you understand that phrase is to realize okay we as human beings have these tendencies we have these things you know in our nature to do it doesn't mean that that's where we place it our time and place of recognizing action is also an individual nature of its own so you're really looking at many I different natures that. So we have actions and then there's conditions, right? And those conditions within the overall conditions. So those are three separate natures that you'd have to evaluate. Plus what motivated those actions, the nature of the mind, the nature of the individual that prompted the nature of the action and the nature of the action prompts the nature of the condition and the condition is within the nature of the world. You understand? So those are all natures interacting with each other, which means that you have to be able to break down what is happening within each interaction. And this is essentially what science aims to do, in my view. Okay. And so do you see your moral philosophy, is it moral philosophy or just your philosophy, um, as, do, do you see it as a, a law, a fact, a logical, reasonable, science-based fact? Or is it a, so. Okay. It, so it's not just a preference that you think, you know, I think human critters would get along better no. if blah, blah, blah. No, I don't think it's a preference. And, and the reason why is because I think we should aim toward being truthful in our lives. We should aim toward having, you know, a guiding direction within our lives that is as most objective as possible um, for guiding ourselves in, into what the world that we want, our desired world. Right. But 
again, then we have the question, well, what does everybody desire? What does that world look like? Is man now touching the world? There's a lot of questions then you have to ask. And so you get really clear on really the best thing you can know, which is yourself. Now, things like you just said, man touching the world. Mm -hmm. I take it you don't mean literally a man, a woman. Yeah, I was. I meant that in both ways. <laughs> something. So, and since I have this, this thing, I'm poetical. Okay, I do that sometimes. <laughs> and so, and I'm going to ask a lot of these things as we chat mm -hmm. because that's good. My challenge is that there's this whole feels system that sure. religion falls into. Anything that can't be proven through my counter simple system, which is reals, reason, empirical evidence, uh, logic, and scientific method. And mm -hmm. so if it doesn't fall within those, then I think eh, it's not really worth looking at. Now, right. a, a friendly neighborhood barbecue and somebody wanna says, wants to say, you know, George Bush is a little bit better than Obama because, uh, okay, whatever, you can be illogical and we'll just, we'll drink a beer and I'll ignore it. But when we're talking about something important like philosophy, then I think it's kind of like building a house. And if there is a single brick in the foundation that isn't explainable, then we need to, okay, can't move beyond that brick until it is completely solid or we've tossed it out and put a new one in. So mm. forgive me if I interrupt a bunch. Um, but no, you're I, good. I don't want to move beyond the I brick do until want I you. understand it. I want you to criticize me and critique me uh, so I can become more truthful as time evolves in my own th way of thinking. And I think this is essential. This is the whole reason why I would want to deflect questions your way, though I know you're asking me questions. I don't want to do that. But I would usually like when I talk to the objectivist, there was an objectivist server on Discord. I I often asked them questions when they were asking me questions because they were asking questions that I knew they knew the answers to. And it bothered me because they were doing that on purpose. <laughs> and I was like, why don't you use your own intuition? Why do you need to hear from me? Why do you need to hear from some old philosopher back then? Or like you said, the dictionary bias, dictionary fallacy. I'm not prone to that. I want people to use their own reason, their own thinking for themselves. And then we improve upon that by talking with others. So absolutely. Okay. So I'm not completely on board, and I and I bought your book. Sure. Um, where, if somebody would like a copy of this, where ought they go to get it? I have a landing page on Nita one slash order, Nita dot one slash order. Um, but they can just go to my Amazon page as well, or um, it's also on other platforms. Just look up my name, Corey Andrelot. It's on the screen for people. They can check it out. <laughs> Sounds good. Um, and I will put that in uh, the description as well. Um, let's see. So that is just to clarify, that is my latest book. Um, it's a short book going over the nature of government and basically um, showing that government is proclaiming to be nature or act in its authority. And whereas it's actually a, a, a practical analysis where within naturosophy, the uh, philosophy that I developed. So the, the main book for naturosophy in my philosophy is called Sapientia Naturae. And there's two versions of that. There's the original text, which is more poetical, might be hard to read for certain individuals, but is meant to do so in order to the individual to question and really reflect for themselves. And then there's the guidebook, which is basically 300 pages of questions. <laughs> okay. So you're using the word poetic, poetical. Um, what is your, not Webster's, mm -hmm. what is your understanding of what that word means? How are you using it? Reflecting upon the universe and being able to see the reflections within yourself, um, in reflection to that. So it's it's being able to look at society as a whole as a reflection of the mind of that society and you within that society as well. Those are all reflections, just as much as I said before to you that every nature is interacting with other natures. These are all different reflections because everything is connected in this universe, uh, being that it's all part of it. Uh, the same I don't universe. understand that at all. I don't understand the reflections thing. How, mm. how like I, I think of a reflection, if I was going to define that word, as something that um, shows what is in front of it back at it, something to that mm -hmm. effect. Yes, so that's, that's what how, I'm... how is, if I look at society, how do I see a reflection? Well, society as a whole um, is, if you break it down, in, comprised of individuals like you and I. And so at the end of the day, it is just you and I, but on a mass scale. So 
we have to look at are there certain mentalities that many individuals have together that's causing a certain reaction among the many people. But of course, I don't like to fall to collectivist notions. I do like to look at the individual and their own mindset. So what I'm referring to as poetical in, in the sense of reflection is the individual reflecting upon that whole of society and seeing their place within it. And oftentimes you'll see throughout history, the poets are the ones that are thinking outside the box because they're doing that reflecting. Um, they're seeing themselves in their impact as opposed to the the rest of the world. You know, I think transcendentalists did a good job in the looking at the imperialism, like the uh, industrialism, industrialization of the the world. You know, they were looking at, oh, here's all these machines and all these cars and all this production, and it's great, but comes at some cost of nature and realizing some spiritual truths. So the transcendentalists were sort of catching on to a lot of this too. I, I feature within Sapiencia Naturae the, the written text called Nature by Ralph Waldo Emerson, where he goes over how man creates ideas, symbols, how man should actually you know rule over nature in a sense, but realize he still has a place within it to to respect a higher nature, you know, an authority of nature. You know, it's not what we call authority in man. It's not what we call authority in governments or kings or queens. Different type of authority. <laughs> you may not even call it authority because it simply is. You have no choice but to follow it. Right. So there is perspective on this and reflections are everywhere, even if you don't see them, I would say, because every word we say comes from a, a concept that we we learned before or some other people who said things a certain way or or some sort of information that we're feeding off of all the time. You can consider these reflections. Now, maybe if you don't want to consider those reflections, that's fine. But yeah, I, would say, I can't wrap my head around <laughs> that. I'm trying to think of another word that would mean the same that is more of a. A like hard science logic reason based than but what's great or... about like poetry i'm sorry it's like because it's shorter usually so it allows for more reflection upon the words it's like you can get a great sense of meaning out of a shorter amount of words than a longer amount of words through poetry and i think that's the magic of why people tend to like it of course this is something that people have to interpret for themselves. <laughs> okay, so so let's just take that one idea that if 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 I look at society, I see a reflection of myself. A, a, that's the poetic way of saying it. What would another way of saying that be? Because I'm not understanding that at all. What what would a way another way that's more of a a boring? And I don't know anything about computers, but let's pretend I was a a programmer because everyone else who's a voluntarist is not everybody, just ninety three percent. What is something that is just a a hard, no poetism to it, no, nothing poetic about it. It's just plain old, just the facts, ma'am. Um, what would be another way of saying that if I, if Shepard looks at society, he sees a reflection of himself? How can I understand that better? Well, let's say someone you know has an experience that you had when you were a young kid. I mean, or think of many memory that you've had. Uh, think of the dreams that you currently get or are going to get. Um, and we may not even be perceive the future as such, but we will look at the past and people do tend to look at the past. And so we're constantly reflecting, um, even just, you can consider thinking as questioning and questioning as reflecting because you have to be looking at something. And so you're sort of like looking through the mirror constantly. If you're looking at your own thoughts, trying to find out what is it that I know, what is it that I can know? And you know, it's not it's not one where you only look at yourself because you're looking at someone else in the case of I'm looking at someone else's experiences and seeing yourself in them. That's what I'm saying. Right. So you can the mirror doesn't come, you know, <laughs> realistically, but also figuratively. Um, it happens all the time. I know as a health coach as well, if I talk to a client about their health. I will realize, oh, wait, I have to pay attention to this in myself as well. A lot of those motivational health coaches out there, people who promote like, you know, medicine or like feel good vibe stuff out there, they're doing a lot of projecting because they want to feel that themselves. They may even struggle a lot themselves and don't share that with the world. But by helping other people, they end up helping themselves. And that's why they continue to do it. Mm -hmm. Okay. I'm, I'm agreeing with a lot of the follow-up things that you're saying. I just... I, I want to be so careful as I try to figure life out because I've been wrong so many times about so many things. And so mm -hmm. I've kind of come up with a system of looking at life. Mm -hmm. And so I use that system to examine things. And so when I try to fit something that is poetic 
into that sit like i love poetry like, like I'm, I'm not against things sounding cool or i wouldn't be a big john prine fan so I, i'm all about things sounding cool like I, I'm, I'm good with that i'm all about minimize well i'm not good at minimizing words but i appreciate it when others do and get a huge wonderful point across in a, a beautiful short way however i want to make sure i'm not falling for a word salad thing where i'm just being baffled by lots of fast talking and mm. Uh, so when I, I, that's why I'm trying to really break things down. Sure. And and sometimes it's just my brain isn't able to wrap around it, which I think is the case with that one example. So this one, I'll just say, well, I don't know what you're talking about. But I agree in your examples. I agree with a lot of that, but yeah, we can kind of move on from there. Law. What, and when you, uh, we think about natural law, there are a lot of old time thinkers. Who was I just reading that was, talking about it that was great i don't know it was not lysander it was some some old timer that was talking about it and and i and i i thought wow a lot of people are into natural law and i i've even i heard one of my videos that i did a couple of years ago and i mentioned it and i didn't even know what i was talking about mm. but i mentioned it. <laughs> so what so it's complete ignorance that i mentioned it so what is like i know that there's a law of gravity i know that there are laws that mcdonald's creates that you have to wear a shirt and shoes and laws that the bad guys have in their states um what when you when i'm we're thinking about the concept of natural law what is the definition of law in that sense well i simply define natural law as nature and that's it i know a lot of people are going to say well it's this and that and this but as you said, there's been many different conceptions all throughout history. If you just break down the definitions, uh, natural means inherent conditions. Law means inherent conditions if we're looking at it in a scientific way. So it's basically just saying like law, law, nature, nature. So <laughs> so from my point of view, it's really just nature. Um, but if you're going to look at it strictly through a morality concept, you might call it natural moral law. And then people start to add words to it on purpose to get more specific. So I don't know if that's what you're asking for in particular, like Mark Pascio, I, I would say what he teaches is natural moral law, not natural law, but he calls it natural law because it's probably easier to say. And it's also yeah. been used throughout history and, you know, fair enough. Okay. And then people are used to that terminology being used in that context. Okay. Okay. Um, so what, getting kind of back to some of my examples of the stick and the, the beer bottle, what are a handful of things that are not natural and what are a handful of things that are nature's natural nature? Um, what are some other things that are e each and why? It's all about knowing why. I think that's the key. So if um, I look at a car, I look at a, a glass, uh, you know, some things some people might consider simple, other ones complex. Uh, it can be any form of any man-made thing changed one way or another. It can be it can be literally someone scooping up some water out of you know some lake, I guess, and saying, "Oh, I have a product now. You know, it's mine." <laughs> they have a sense of attachment to it. It could be anything that they um, sort of take out of nature because humans—that's what we do, and this is how we create. Uh, and actually, I'm quite a fan of that. I'm not against us creating. I've always been an inventor since a very young age. I've invented games. And really, it's not so much creating, however, it's improvising. It's being able to see what tools and resources you have at your disposal and then turning it into different forms and different formats. And you can find out the possibilities are quite endless. So that's the beauty of creativity. I think that's also the beauty of the free market, just you know, as an FYI, is being able to see different products in circulation, not just one product being imposed upon everyone. That's a beautiful thing. And that's what you see all throughout nature is there's this endless possibility to do anything you want, but it doesn't mean you do it. it doesn't mean it's right to. Do. So the question is, is there a time and place for certain things to be done? Do we have to learn from our actions to know what to do and what not to do? All right. So that that would be my answer to you on this is so like, let's say we look at a car, you know, 
is how many deaths are caused by a car as opposed to other methods of transportation. Okay, we say we can adapt to this. We say it's the similar nature to that of uh, walking. It's just faster, perhaps. Maybe it involves some complex machinery we have to gather from across the world. Whoa, well, how are we getting that material? You can ask billions of questions. The point of this philosophy is not to provide you with so many answers as it is questions, because the questions, again, within your own life, for your own self, will help yourself find answers for yourself because only you can know yourself the best and only you are living your life. So it's about that sovereignty of using your mind, which I so heavily emphasize. Um, and so it's more of, I guess you can say a tool than anything else okay. um, because it's all it can ever be is a guide. That's all it ever can be. I'm not saying my book is the Bible. It's the holy thing. It's must be, it, it is the word of God. And if you don't follow it, you're going to go to hell. No, <laughs> right? I, I it's it's just a guide. It's all just a resource as to any like any other book trying to find our way. And and it's my projection, my reflection on paper, essentially. You know, it's my form of creativity. So it's still limited in form. It's still incomplete because it was man-made. And so understanding the nature of those man-made things is to realize, wait, cars have not always existed as much as walking. What happens if we get attached to cars? They say attachment is bad, a bad thing in Buddhism and a lot of Eastern philosophies. Why is it that they say attachment is bad? Why do they say things are bad? Perhaps it has to do with the fact that the man is taking away from nature or their more natural habits. So they're not walking as much. Oh, it might have an effect on their health. Oh, it might make everything seem very fast paced. And all of a sudden the whole world changes in different ways. And some people don't know why it's changing that way because they're detached from nature. It's not a world that they recognize or can know. It's a world that they have to learn and come to condition themselves into. Not that they can't condition themselves into it. It's all the matter of knowledge. See what I mean? I think I do. Um, and, and this ties into something that I, I've, I've thought for a while. I, I've said you can't beat nature in, in some ways. Like you, you can't put up a wall that will last longer than nature you can't yeah you're building a dam and that's a really cool work of art and i'll go on your little tour but in five thousand or fifty thousand years it's not going to be there um, neither is your great wall of china it'll last another little while and then if you come back a hundred thousand years from now the thing's gone um <laughs> nature has won and i won't be here either probably then um so i i, I have a respect for what kind of my rough undefined definition of uh, nature is, and I'm good with that. I think my challenge when I look at a, a moral philosophy or when I look at something as a guidebook, um, why is there something in nature that would prevent me from hitting a couple women over the head and dragging them into my cave and making my genes continue for a long time? Is there a, a rule or a guide or something within it's funny you put up. because if I ask you that question in a voluntarist con context, what would you say to me? If there's a demand, there's a supply, if there's people willing to defend other people, who's to say humans are not part of that natural universe, that they are not the ones that can help reap the, the sowing? I'm so not, I'm, I'm, I'm not saying like a, an anvil will drop on your head, but I'm not saying that humans are just going to stand still when something bad happens. And you know this, this is why oh, we talk about voluntarism. Yeah, I'm right? sorry. I, I meant that from a from a moral philosophy standpoint, not from what the how society would react. But like, what is it inherently wrong to grab grab up a couple women by the hair and drag them into a cave? Or is that a like what makes why might we agree? Hey, that ain't cool. Um, you consent. shouldn't do that. You shouldn't do that, dude. Ownership. Um, okay, where do consent and ownership come from? Where is that foundation? Like, it's a preference that you and I both agree. Hey, we prefer that to not. Um, but if we're trying to actually factually prove something, we need more than yeah, it feels right. Um, or mm -hmm. do we? Is that nature telling us? Are, are our feels some word from nature? Um, or, or what is the foundation to it? Uh, well, we can't ignore the feels, but of course, that ne doesn't ne necessarily mean we it, all our actions doesn't come from that one source. As we both recognize, there's other ways we can learn, such as through factual reasoning, uh, may you say. So, you know, science and different ways of looking at the world, uh, it's all 
coming into fruition to fill in the gaps and the holes. And people are just seeing this with the market. Again, it's like if there's a demand, there's a supply. It's funny because religion is dying nowadays and you have the growth of atheism and science. That's because the religion has been affecting people for so long on this earth and people are realizing it's not helping us. You know, So like I'm just saying that these are different things in society that people are starting to realize. Doesn't mean that everybody should become atheist. Doesn't mean that's the only solution. Doesn't mean right? It's it's all just a matter of understanding. So try to help me uh, get back what you were trying to ask me, because I just wanted to clarify on that. Yes. What is the what is the foundational, what's the building block? Why is it wrong to initiate violence, oh, whether it's dragging right. cave women around or whatever? Yeah. So ownership. And you were like, well, what determines ownership and, and what or determines consent. Yeah. consent? Well, I can only breathe for me. You can only breathe for you, right? So like Actually, our faculties remain have other things, but I can maybe only talk like, I mean, they have the rebreathers. Naturally the you breathe for you. Cause that's always been the way it is. How the hospital machinery is a new phenomenon. Yeah. It hasn't always existed. What is natural is what has always existed because again, nature is defined as birth or initial character. So it's kind of weird to say like, oh, well, because hospitals can do it, therefore it's right. Or we can like, no, I, I wouldn't permit hospitals giving people oxygen because now we're saying it's okay for people not to breathe for themselves. I think people should be breathing for themselves. We should promote people breathing for themselves. <laughs> you see what I mean? So we got to be careful because if we make a justification for the man-made and say, oh, well, I need my phone with me because without my phone, I can't contact my parents. It's like, okay, well, now it's basically another body part of yours and you can't live without it. Now you have an, an attachment to a thing. No, I, I, dis I disagree. Um, but I know this strays away from the original question. I'm just saying yeah. this is kind of answering the other question that you had. So <laughs> so when it talks, when it comes to ownership and consent, that's what I'm saying is you breathe for you, I breathe for me. You can't undo that process. It doesn't matter. You justify it through machines, through science, through hospitals. It doesn't matter because nature has it so that each one of us breathes for ourselves. Unless you can prove to me otherwise you know, but you can't unless you do it through some fancy machinery. It's not something that nature naturally provides or has always provided. Okay. So, so my argument was like, I, I was just responding to you saying <laughs> sure. that you breathe for you and I breathe for me. And that's, that's factually inaccurate. Um, a thousand years ago, maybe you breathe for you and I, I breathe for me, not us, but <laughs> two different people. But right now, like we could, we could meet in a city in a hospital and we could go in there and see a human being who is still breathing, but it's a machine doing it for them. And hopefully it'll get them through a bad week and they'll be able mm. to take off on their own. So, I mean, it, it is happening. Uh -huh. It might not be good. It might be right. good. It might be bad to extend life artificially. It might be good or bad to well, think about use that. a plastic raincoat to stay dry and not get hypothermia. If but see, it's all knowledge. You just admitted to the fact that we recognize that what the what the machine is trying to do is mimic a natural function that should be there in the very first place. So long as we don't attach ourselves to that machine doing, we can remain of our natural function. Otherwise, that natural function will be completely replaced by the machine because we say, oh, well, if the machine can breathe, we don't need to worry about breathing. So you recognize that there's a higher authority in this thing we call breathing, which is that human beings are supposed to breathe for themselves, regardless of, oh, we might have the machines that help us breathe. But that help shouldn't have to be there if we already breathe for ourselves. In fact, maybe maybe the fact that people aren't breathing is a sign that, you know, that there's something wrong that we have to look at, that something else is going on. Maybe they were a smoker, maybe they're on a certain drug, something's preventing their breathing. But we wouldn't ask that question if we just stopped at, at a certain level and said, no, the machine should do it. If we ask and say, wait, the, the human body is supposed to breathe for itself because its nature is supposed to do so. Then we say, okay, well, what is causing it? What's causing the problem? But we wouldn't go that far if we didn't recognize nature underneath. You see what I mean? I do. I, I don't think that has. It has I, great relevance. Okay. Um. Yeah, I'm. I'm not seeing because I because I think those are different issues. Like if we and I know attached is a, not like a a reels kind of word, but if we use if we choose to use a lot, whether it's a respirator or a raincoat 
made of plastic or whatever, it's going to make us softer, perhaps, if we stay alive, but we might not be alive otherwise. And so I mm. think it's a choice if we choose to say every single time when we, all of our lives, we will not have the sun touch our skin. We'll either be indoors or we'll go outside and be wearing a, a veil and a, a, a whole outfit. So we will never get sunburned. That is a, could be argued to be, ah, oh, that's not a good idea. But that is just kind of a, a preference, a different idea of you think that's better for your life. I think you're crazy, man. I think you need to get some sun, but don't get so so much that you're burned right. horribly. Um, so, so I have so a chapter I, about this. Okay. I have a chapter called Natural Effects, where it goes over what is denaturing and what is naturalizing. Um, essentially, what is it that supports nature and what is it that violates nature? It's looking at two different ends, right? I know Mark Passio has his definition of right and wrong. Wrong is something that steals from, you know, it's always something that's a form of theft or a form of harm, right? And so this is his definition. And then he says, what is right is basically anything that's not what is wrong. Well, I, I basically have the perspective that no, it's actually the opposite. So what is wrong is actually what violates, you know, or yeah, what, what violates nature in, or steals from, takes from, um, steals from, to be more specific, taking form of, you know, doesn't have to be stealing. And then what is right would be something that gives to or supports the natural. And you can give to someone by not stealing from them, because in a sense, you're letting them live. So that is a sense of allowing people to live their life. And allowing and embrace is everything to do with Taoism, which is essentially my philosophy in a nutshell in one way or another. <laughs> He's like, I'm basically describing a more Socratic view of Taoism in my philosophy, if I had to sum it up. <laughs> hmm. are, are, is, is any portion of it like, is there a way to explain it that a, a, a rigid German dude like me, um, with the Germanic personality, no, just the facts, and, and the, is there a way to explain it that it could be understood by someone like me? Yes, knowledge, if it's helpful, useful, it's good. And if it's not knowledge, then it's ignorance. It's something that is keeping you, holding you back. Knowledge is the very thing that helps you understand nature. So any knowledge, it could be even the knowledge of ignorance itself. So that is good. But if I use my knowledge to invent a respirator and we use it, that's bad? Well. What, what, where, okay, you're using it to build respiratory for what you realize it's to help people breathe. You're helping their natural mm -hmm. function. So that's not a bad thing, is it? Because you have knowledge as to what you're creating and what the effects are of what you're creating. Okay. So now you know what you're creating, but you might end up not having enough knowledge because you realize, oh shoot, what I created is end up hurt, harming people. It's ending up doing mm -hmm. did not intend to happen, but the reason why I did not intend for that to happen was because I thought I had knowledge, but I really didn't. I actually was ignorant of some things I didn't realize. And this is why it's important to always recognize we're all ignorant, all of us, and we all don't know everything. And starting from that point of view allows us to have philosophy, which is why I created my own, because I feel like philosophy has led to the direction of people saying, this is the way it is, and this is the only way it can be, especially in the natural law Mark Passio crowd. This is the way it must be said. This is the way it must be done. I disagree. <laughs> There's many other ways to look at it. As proven by Lysander Spooner, a teacher of natural law, similar concepts, totally different words. He never says a right is what doesn't cause harm, but he's basically saying that. <laughs> you know, love of von Mises, these other people, Mises, sorry, you know, these people are all saying similar things just in different ways. And so I think there's value in that. But if you're able to see that perspective, then you could have more knowledge about it instead of being ignorant and just throwing it to the side, saying, oh, they don't say things the way I want them to say it. And they have no no, you know, use in this world. People say, oh, I don't like Nietzsche. I don't like these philosophers. They're bad. It's like, you realize if we did not have their bad ideas, we would not recognize the better ideas. We need everybody's ideas. That's the beauty, again, of the free market <laughs> in ideas, because you need competing interest in order to get the best product. And I, and I agree with that. Like, I, I really think that even, you know, even the bad podcasters out there or content producers who are doing complete gobbledygook nonsense, 
and I would use Passio as a great example of that. And then when Disenthrall did their 400 hour watching of his stuff and taking it down, that turned out to like, I'm very glad Passio made his thing because it, it gave somebody else an opportunity to teach logic and reason. And mm. so I'm, a lot of my content has got to be wrong. There's no way I could be right about, you know, to leave in a lion's share of my stuff. I try, but eh, I'm probably messing up on a lot of stuff. Well, that provides somebody else. I hope people swoop in and say, nope, you said this and that's wrong. I'm like, gosh, you're right. Um, and so that's I, why I, I love that. I, I I laugh when people just repeat the philosophy line. This is exactly why I, I attack the appeal to nature fallacy, because they just assume all of nature is a fallacy in the sense by saying, oh, well, you can't say what is natural is what is good. What if you know what is natural? I mean, yeah, if somebody's going to the grocery store and they say, oh, it says natural, so it must be healthy, and they know nothing about if any of the ingredients are actually natural, then of course they're not, they're gonna have a misconception of of nature or of reality. They're gonna put things into their body which may be completely unnatural. So it's all the matter of knowledge. They're making basically an unknowledgeable appeal. So are they really making an appeal? They're just ignorant. And that's why I'm saying nature is so dependent on knowledge and you can make an appeal. Otherwise you can't really have an appeal. You can't really have nature without knowledge. You need knowledge. So if I said, Aval and I'm, I've, I'm just trying to go through in my brain and give my argument and then give your response. Tell me how I do. Shepard says avalanches are bad, Corey. Boom, I gotcha because they kill people. And then Corey says, ah, but you have to have knowledge. If you see the snow is about to slide, don't walk there, dude. Yeah, if you know about it, then don't don't walk there. But you know that's that's your choice still as to if you want to do it and you recognize that knowledge too. You might recognize, oh wait, the avalanche is happening for a reason, and why is it happening? More knowledge, of course, to be found. So the things that are more natural, avalanches, tornadoes, uh, tidal waves, all this kind of stuff that kill a bunch of people. A bunch of mm. innocent people. Is this just nature's book. pardon? I have a section in my book uh, dedicated to that as well. I should pull that up. Yeah. So, so what's kind of the you know when I lose my cousin to a tornado because they've rebuilt in the same mobile home in Oklahoma for the forty seventh time in Tornado Alley. Um, when this <laughs> happens, um, yeah, it was nature that got them, but I still think that kind of sucks. Were they a dummy to do that? Maybe I, I might argue that, but. If it's natural, it's good. And you didn't say that. I'm putting words in your mouth. I just heard others say that. If it's natural, it's good. Well, tornado is natural and it killed folk. And how is that good for you, for a person? So we're going to blame nature for something humans can avoid and can prevent or because here's the deal. You can't change nature. Nature is going to do its things no matter what. There's always going to be poisons. So, oh my gosh, I touched a poisonous plant. I have poison now. It's like you chose to to touch that plant. Same way with these people living there. You chose to live there. I live in Florida now. I can get hit by a tidal wave. I know the risks involved with living here, but we take risks every single day within our lives. At a certain point, you have to realize that you need to embrace the natural reality, but you can escape the artificial, unnatural reality. It is a choice in that regards. Okay, so there are certain things you can't change, and you can call those earthquakes and stuff bad, but maybe there is a way to be prepared. Maybe with enough knowledge, you can prepare way in advance. Guess what? Now we have technology that can that can predict disasters way before they happen. And with these things we call natural disasters are not even a thing, according to scientists nowadays. They say they're hazards. They're not, there's no such thing as a natural disaster. They they're disasters, they're just things that happen in nature. Who's to say they are a disaster? They only are disaster when humans say, oh my gosh, all these things are broken. Oh my gosh, all these things are happening. It doesn't have to be. It could mm -hmm. be just part of the way of life. And I'm not saying that, okay, well, you know, let's just normalize earth. But again, what are you going to do about it? You can't change it. It is nature. So you have to learn to live with it. Kind of like what Epictetus said about people as well. If you don't like people, you can't force them to, to change. You have to either educate them or learn to bear them. This again goes back to the idea of voluntarism. It's like you're not going to commit violence on someone to make them change. You're going to teach them or help them understand why they're wrong, right? And if you have to, if they're really violating upon you, defend yourself and prevent the wrongdoing from happening to yourself. Okay. So our mutual, 
I don't know. I shouldn't put words in your mouth. Our mutual friends or or fellow travelers, uh, the Disenthrall crew, um, talks about anti-subjectivism. That's kind of mm-hmm. that's the moral philosophy that they've spent years creating, and you have created um, yours. And because I'm gonna uh, pronounce it incorrectly, I won't even try. Uh, it's, it looks so easy, and then I try to say it and I fumble over it. Um, Natureosophy. Mm-hmm. Um, is yours? I mean, how would you say that those not the not the results of them or what they say but are those both roughly the same structure are they both moral philosophies or how how would they differ how would they contrast i would say they contrast in the sense that nature philosophy is based mostly on questions and getting the individual to think for themselves about themselves uh, again, which is why the original text is for individual reflection, and then the guidebook is for even more individual reflection with questions, but also as a curriculum for teachers to do so in a classroom setting. So um, it's more so to get individuals to think and use their own nature, because I also have another phrase that says, use your nature or lose your nature. It's very important. If we stop using our legs, stop using our arms, guess what? <laughs> you don't have them anymore. Body and motion stays in motion, we say. Right. Okay. Um, so I'm almost, I'm almost liking, liking it better than I, than I was before we started chatting because I was thinking of it more as a, this is a, a factual reason-based logic-based scientific foundation. And if I look at it that way, I, I didn't even make it. I mean, I was writing so many scribbles in the side assertion, and then there's nothing backing it up. And then another assertion, but if I don't look at it that way, if I look at it as, hey, here's a here's a poem or a song, and if it means something to you and you kind of get some good feelings out of it, hey, hey, brother. I'm well, isn't that everything? No, it's not science. It's not like logic and reason. It's but that's a different. Still, system. people do that with science. How so? People attach themselves to certain forms of sciences and philosophies all the time. Some of them, and people usually do so because they think they get some sort of truth out of it. And people wouldn't take some truth unless they got some sort of personal benefit out of it. You can't leave out the individual and their feelings because it's always part of the picture. You know, this is why we want freedom. We don't just want freedom because it is freedom. Like we want freedom because we know it's going to make people happy. We know it's going to prevent death. We know that it's it's something that we want ourselves. Am I wrong? I would agree with the last part. I, I know it's what I want, but I would never presume to centrally plan or, or to predict that it would be better for everybody. Like, I think it would. But well, then would why never... would you educate it to other people? Because I think it would. And I'm saying, hey, brother, I think if we take this trail, I don't know. But I think if we you don't take know. that trail, we'll get over there. Oh, no, I, I sure don't. If I did, it was it Stefan Molyneux or That's somebody key. who said, if I had the answers, then that would be a good argument that there should be government and mm. I should be the head of it. But right. the fact is, I don't know, and neither does anybody. Mm. So, so you're admitting to your own ignorance. Should, That's beautiful. Oh, 100%. Yeah, I, I know so little. Um, and the system that I use, and I'm desperately seeking to understand other systems, I've come to realize that uh, theology is a, it, it doesn't use the system that I use, the reals system. It uses some other system. And maybe that other system is better, but no one has ever explained to me here's how you understand this or a woke person. If you use logic and reason for one of their crazy things, it's a crazy thing. And then I say, okay, maybe I'm wrong to use logic and reason and and empirical evidence and scientific method. Okay. What is your system? And I've just never heard of another system to understand other things other than feels. And so, yeah, I could be wrong. I just, I want to know the system so that I can try something else. And yeah, maybe that'll make sense, but Right. I, I never heard of a system to understand it. Yeah. I, the reason why I created Naturosophy is I found Mark Passio's philosophy incomplete. I mean, I studied that and I taught it for several years, right? And I was repeating the talking points and I understood it deeply. And I still think his philosophy can be greatly helpful for a lot of people, but it isn't the end. It isn't the end. And I don't think people should stop there. They should continue looking um, toward finding the answers within their own life and their own philosophies and other people's philosophies, because, you know, it's beautiful what he created, but it's, it's just another philosophy, just like mine. And, and I tell people, it's like, my philosophy is not yours. Like it's not, it's not supposed to be yours. It's just a guide. So I don't want followers. I'm not looking for followers. I'm not looking for the fame. I'm not looking for that. And when I challenged you on the appeal to nature, I'm just genuinely saying like, Hey, 
why are there so many people repeating this fallacy when there's another point of view? Even the Wikipedia page says, hey, the appeal to nature fallacy could be made with enough knowledge. And I'm like, even the Wikipedia page says it. Isn't that funny? <laughs> and um, and I, I'm surprised people have not enough looked at that perspective. And because I've always lived my life with you know this phrase I call nature is the answer, looking up to that authority, I've been sort of looking at it and say, well, how is it that 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 can be proven? Can it be proven? Um, and I'm not saying that this is a bias that I'm coming into, but who wouldn't be biased about nature if it's the reality that you have no choice but to live with? It's like the people who say the is ought fallacy. Well, I disagree with that fallacy too, to an extent, because you have to live with nature. It's not like you're making an emotional appeal, adding your own emotion, saying there ought to be something. The ought is <laughs> the odd like the, 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 it's a self-contradictory system in the sense that nature is something you can't contradict you can't change so you have no choice but to live with it and so um there is value in mark passio's teachings i think a lot more than people realize and the more they study the occult and a lot of the the points that he has but i don't think it it is conceptually brought out uh through text as well as uh, what I've created for everything, because he only limits it to action. And I, like I said, have different definitions for certain things. So again, that's just the beauty of the free expression of ideas. But um, I do think that it's it's limited in many ways. And I, I, I've been gathering notes about that too, because you know, I, I not to make anybody mad, but I just want to say like, hey, there's other ways of approaching it. Um, yeah. That's the truth. Yeah. And and then I think there's the, I like exactly what you said, ways of approaching it. Uh, not just that it could be different, but the way in which one approaches it. And I think that's that's going to be different for different people. I think people who are reared in a cult, which I was reared in a cult. And so the people who I was around had a very different perspective on life than somebody who was reared by a, a scientist family. Um, you're just You're going to view things differently unless you go out and do some study and uh, figure out if he's like the cult way or the the reason way. Um, See, I'm not about like justifying transhumanism and all these people who say we can just change all of reality. Uh, AI, I'm I'm I think AI is great, can have so many great benefits that can help society, absolutely. But I'm not to say that that is what should be our reality. Um, in fact, if it isn't, nature will tell us by karma, by by our results, our effects. And this is where, again, Mark Passio is hitting it on the nail again and again, just if you're able to see the perspective like karma and, and consequentialism, like the idea of cause and effect, like people can't really argue with those things. It's the other things he adds in, some of the words and other things that people tend to not like, um, but there's still so much truth in it. And so I don't, I don't think people should pass it off at, at all. Hmm. Yeah. I, I guess my, my challenge with that, my, my argument with that, with that would be if I am looking at, at something, I'm watching the contractor build my, my house and I see him using really crappy foundational blocks, then I'm like, okay, you've laid three of those now, man. Let's, let's talk <laughs> about this. Is this some new material that's stronger than cement? If so, great. But explain it to me. Well, no, you just have to feel and believe that it's going to withhold the pressure of the house. No, I don't want to. No, I want this to be a science, an engineering yeah. thing. I just and don't so think him, Mark I've is claiming to... that. I don't oh, think Mark no. is claiming. Yeah. Oh, but his stuff is such crap. Um, I, you know, I lasted maybe three minutes. I went to one of his seminars in, in uh, Mexico and I, and I walk in and I thought, wow, he's, he's got a big following. Maybe he has something to say. I hadn't heard of him before. And I just listened to him as he started. And I'm like, okay, I know enough about con artists that, no, this ain't for me. And as soon as he made a number of mistakes, I, of course, didn't write them down. I just walked out mm. and went and had more beers. Yeah, um, I'm not going to challenge anything because I don't know what you're referring yeah, to specifically. Yeah. But Yeah, and that's a complete I, see, subjective thing that I'm saying. Like, that's, yeah. Uh, and but, I'd be willing, if you have those notes on my book, like on hand, I mean, any of the assertions I make, I'd be willing to to look at them because I'm genuinely curious. I told you this. Yeah. And so let me see. And I'm going to uh, let me ask okay. you a question so you can talk while I'm reading this and give some people some value. Um, so they're not just watching me. Um, what haven't I asked so far that would be a good thing to bring up at this point? Well, 
It's understanding the dynamic between the natural and unnatural, which stems from nature and the opposite reality, which is just an illusion. There's no such thing. And that's the key, is realizing that what man has created hasn't really created anything. Like we can say we've created cars, we've created towers, but and we can identify those things, but one earthquake, one natural event, it's all gone. No one knows what happened. And you know, what is there has always been there, which is the earth. And it, not to take it from that more, you know, um doomsday perspective, but to say that there's always underlying um foundations to everything. And in health, it's the same way when I look at somebody's body, maybe they have a bunch of diseases, they're going through a bunch of different things. I have to find out where's their original body? Like where, where did it start going wrong? Where did they start getting hooked on these addictions? These addictions now are their life. Their life is now dependent on these addictions. It becomes their life. And that consumes them to the point where they no longer have a life. Why? It's because they lived in an illusion. And that is technology. Technology is a great illusion. The fact I can see you like as if I'm in person mm -hmm. is crazy. That's an illusion, my friend. It's not real, but it is. It's just not the same way, way it has always been. Recognizing that is knowledge. If you don't recognize that, this is my reality. I can't see anything more. There's going to be some downsides to that, even if you don't think there is. Oh, I'll get some makeup. I'll get some tattoos, some piercings. Oh, it's not going to affect anybody. It's not going to hurt anybody. How do you know that? Do you know for a fact? Because there's many chemicals in those things. What are you doing it? Do you have some sort of mental problem that you need to address? Maybe you don't want to address it. There are so many underlying psychological phenomena that nobody would ask unless they really challenged, why am I doing this? And asking why is always getting down to the root cause. And that's asking what belongs, what is intended. That's nature. So nature has an intent, like a cognitive intent. Or is it just from kind of, that's our, what's happening and that's probably what's going to happen to you, dude? From our point of view, looking upon nature, yes. Nature itself is not going to be like, here's the intent. Of course, though, it'll show through our, you know, the effects, which again, we are perceiving. So it's going through us and we have to recognize that we're not perfect. So therefore, everything that we perceive as an intent, is not necessarily the intent. But okay. nonetheless, we start to find that out over time, such as the fact, wait, humans are not supposed to be living with governments. They're always causing death and problems. And wait, humans don't need slavery. Slavery is not our natural condition. We found that out after thousands of years of experience and people realizing we don't need this. Okay. Uh Brothers and sisters, if you'll turn with me to page six, <laughs> um, I'm going to read a uh, yeah first half of a paragraph because I have two things there. The first uh, sentence and a half, I have a, a note there that it's an assertion, and then I have a uh, big no with an exclamation point illogical after that. Um, so the essential understanding for what is considered of nature based on our definitions is viewing nature through the lens of time. And this would kind of go back to what we were saying about the stick versus the bottle. No, it wouldn't because the bottle was newer than the stick, but it still wasn't. So that wouldn't be an example after all. Um, mm -hmm. While everything within nature, the micro is constantly changing, nature, the macro stays the same. If nature is the constitution, birth, or initial character, the source or God that is core to change itself, then the natural must be what has all be what has always existed, being that it is of nature. And then the, this next sentence was the big one I had a problem with. The nature is then an, an alignment to nature, the present aligned to the ever present the micro aligned to the macro. Don't get it. I don't get that at all. Okay. So if you go back to the previous sentence, it says, if nature is a constitution, et cetera, itself, then the natural must be what has always existed. Okay. Then it says the natural is not in alignment to nature because the natural stands for of nature. Remember that definition? So the natural, if it's of nature, it's of forever. It's of the timeless. It's of the constitution. It's of the initial characters of all those other definitions, right? So that's what it's saying. It's an alignment. 
because the natural is just another word for nature, just being old. The old says of, so it's part of. And aren't we part of nature? We're part of this universe, part of that constitution. So if we align to what has always existed, then it's the present aligns to the ever-present, what was here before us, nature, the earth, universe. Why then would would a, a wise person, why would you advise anyone to do anything that is unnatural, like live in a house, own headphones, have a computer, et cetera? Advise them to have that? Right. I'm saying advise them to know that it's not the only way to live, <laughs> to know okay. that there is something higher that was there before. If you don't know the roots to why or how the machine was built, you're going to get lost later in time. You're so not going to know how to build it back up. Okay. So then, and, and I, I, I love the idea of the philosophy of um, learning to do something the tough way. Um, like, let's try this first heaving and hoeing. And then when that doesn't work, now let's bring out the hydraulics and use it. But let's remember that we can use levers and fulcrums and we can still lift that heavy thing even mm -hmm. without a hydraulic diesel tractor. Um, so right. I, I, mm -hmm. I agree with that part. Um, so then is there, so then nature isn't naturally superior or good. It's just something that we're like, you know what? I've been watching this for the last history of humanity that's written that I've, that I know about. And it seems to me that there's always going to be a stick that falls from a tree. And if I'm going to beat my rug, I might as well get used to beating it with a stick because this man made rug beaten stick might not be around. Whereas the natural one will be. So I should know that both exist. And then if I really find mm. the new fangled one to work a lot better, like I find these work better than winds whispering through trees. So I wear them. <laughs> Is that a right. accurate? You have knowledge. Yes. The knowledge okay. is the key to all of it because you understand the natures in relation to each other. Now, you may not have full knowledge of it because you created something that, that you know, you can only take certain aspects thereof nature to create. Like you, you, you only took certain aspects of this reality to create any man-made thing. And nature operates as a whole. It operates coming back to itself in a sense, um, a sense of rejuvenation, restoration, whatever you want to look at it. Um, everything goes back to source. You know, there may be many philosophies talking about the cycle of life and death, et cetera. So it's all about understanding the foundations to humanity, which, yes, we should have that upheld through the generations. Yes, we should remember what keeps us human, because if we don't, we'll lose it. Or we'll go we're so confused to the point where we end up destroying ourselves. And so basically, I'm looking at the long term future with this philosophy and saying that, well, I'd be bold enough to claim that this philosophy is the thing that keeps humanity intact when the robots take over the world. If, if you want to be, you know, frank about it, <laughs> if, if, you know, not governments were already worse than that. Because frankly, I would consider technology to be the second government, the way it operates. Um, but it's a little bit different, of course, <laughs> two different natures. Otherwise, we wouldn't distinguish such. But government itself is basically an illusion. Um, and technology, although this is an illusion, government is also one. It's just one that exists purely in the mind. It's very right. dangerous um, because it's actually taking the place of nature. And that's the whole point of this book that I talked about. Okay. Okay. Taking the whole place, meaning everything. It has a constitution of its own. Nature is defined as constitution. <laughs> Nature is defined as order. Governments proclaim that you need their existence for order. Everything they say, man's law, we need our law. What about natural law? Is there such a concept that has ever been discussed throughout history? You know, everything governments have done has been just taking from the natural world and saying, but we need this for existence. It's not even like it's an option. It's not like it's a choice. It's we need it. And if we're dependent on it, then it's basically our God. It's like we have to worship it. We have to beg for permission to be free. We have to ask it to change our reality for us. And it does have that power to change it. It's our reality. What gives it that power? Again, our beliefs. It's the greatest illusion of all. Yeah, you know, and this is not so much philosophy as just kind of a, a living life as a, as a smart or savvy person, not smart, but a savvy person. You know, for years I've been not frustrated, but I've looked at those automatic headlights that come on in these newfangled cars and, uh, and the ones that are now auto 
dimming when you have an on approaching car with a certain light. And I'm thinking that's making us dumber. Back in the old days, <laughs> in the old 72 Nova, you would pull the switch out to turn the light on. And you had to be sharp as a human being and say, hey, it's getting dark out. I should turn the lights on. And then now for all of these last 20 years, 30 years of my life, I haven't even had to think about turning on the light. Well, no, it should just naturally come on. And every so often I'll see somebody driving down the streets for a good distance with no lights on. Technology failed them. They probably didn't mm. have it set correctly. And now their natural ability to say, hey, it's dark and I'm moving fast and I ought to be able to light up the way and have people see me. Now they are more helpless than they would have been if they'd done it the hard way. And I'm not at all arguing that lights should be only pull lights. I'm not arguing for that. But well, it is there you have to watch. There you have, though, an example of something man-made taking the place of what was naturally there. Now, it's different if you have a choice, if you recognize your choices, if you're able to have that choice versus just having one man-made choice that you were conditioned into and you don't see any other possible reality out of it. There's a lot of people who are born into cities or born into technology, like I said, with smartphones, and they can't see reality without it. That, to me, is a huge danger because now they lost touch with thousands and thousands of years of human history and ancestry that goes back without it because they can't imagine a reality without it. So that's where I have the concept of man-made authority versus natural authority as well in, in, in this book. You know, I was talking about, is there dependence on man or is there dependence on nature? Where do you place that? You know, and, and really there's no dependence on nature. If you, if you have a mind of your own, if you're knowledgeable, really nature as your governor, you won't even recognize it as a governor. It's just there. Yeah, yeah it's, it's there. <laughs> you exist within it. Hey, right. It's but because, rain. What can I but put over myself to stay dry? But because, yeah, because you're thinking about it for yourself and you're using your own brain, whether you recognize it or not, you're using your nature. Nature is working with you because you're doing what you're supposed to be doing. <laughs> so you're not anti-technology. No. You're anti-technology dependence. Exactly. Okay. I, or any man-made thing for that to matter. Um, but yes, technology is dangerous mostly because it's the illusory nature. It gives a greater illusion than other things. So for the person who chooses to live in Montana, where it gets really cold and deep snow, and they're having to use to live in a little cabin that they built with a handsaw and chinking and all this man-made stuff, this non-natural stuff, ought everybody to move where it's warmer? Or is it okay to push push nature and use this technology that's been around for a while of houses, cabins, and live there. Right. What are your general thoughts there? We learn from time, right? What we should do and what we should not do. We see houses are benefiting our nature. If they give us natural effects, as I have a dedicated you know, chapter to that, as I said, then it's something that you can say, yeah. I mean, we understand what it's doing, why it's why we have it. We're not dependent on it necessarily just because, oh, houses are very useful. Now, maybe you say, well, we need a house. But yeah, I mean, there's a lot of people we could say they need a house. But imagine being able to say we don't need it. Maybe we're strong enough without it. We don't see that possibility, but there's people out there who live without it. You know, so it's being able to see that possibility, which I don't want people to lose, because if they grow attached to it too much, then the needs never stop going. <laughs> and it's like, I need this, I need that, and I need that. Never ends. Yeah. Consumerism. And there's certainly, kind of what you're saying, there's certainly some Stoic, and you have quite a few quotes from Stoics, that, that whole idea, I don't remember which dude it was, but he says, yeah, he says, I like to run around in crappy clothes that really itch my body, the coarse clothing. And uh, yeah, do that every so often. I'm like, oh, okay, now, now I know I can handle it, and then get back to eating well or whatever. And then some of the Stoics would just say, no, I I don't have a need for that anymore. I know I can survive the worst of the worst. And uh, yeah, I'm going to live poorer now. Yeah. And it's still I'm a not personal a big, choice. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm not, by the way, I'm not deifying Stoics. A bunch of them were status rich dudes <laughs> who were double talking and, and had the luxury to double talk. But I love a lot of what the Stoics had to say. They were mm -hmm. some, some oh, cool, yeah. I cool mean, dudes. family fathers too. 
You know, it's like you look at the founding father text, you're like, well, yeah, I agree with George Washington, Ben Franklin, but then you're like, I don't agree with their actions, but yeah. I agree with Wait, their words. Wait, Whiskey Rebellion? <laughs> I thought we were, huh? <laughs> yeah, um, and so I make those disclaimers as well in my books. I'm like, even me as a person, you can hold me accountable and I'm pleased do, but like, don't hold, expect me to uphold my own philosophy. Do you think any philosopher in the past upheld their own philosophy 100%? No, <laughs> it's it's all a matter of standard that most philosophers are trying to aim for because they're trying to find a way of living that can benefit society. And that's why they bring it to other people and why they're considered educators or they lead the next generation of philosophers. Yeah, and I, I kind of I like the idea of having there's uh, something I like about anti-subjectivism is that there's this base of, OK, there's only one rule we're, we're consent. That's that's the one rule. Can't do anything that isn't consensual. And then I say, and I recently have had some arguments um, uh, with Christian and before that Patrick, a bunch of going back and forth, uh, just typing. And then we we did a couple episodes, and I'm still arguing and I'm still unhappy because some of the scenarios that I put forth, I'm not happy with the answer that anti-subjectivism gives. It doesn't hmm. make me feels good. When I think about, well, that, no, that doesn't seem right. That philosophy should have an answer. And I think that kind of the answer to my argument is that, that they made, and I go, okay, good point, is, oh, no, this philosophy doesn't cover what the best time of the day to get up is. Like, is it better to get up at 4 a.m. than <laughs> right. 9 a.m.? No, this doesn't cover everything. This right. covers hardly anything. It covers the very bare bones foundation that if it's consensual, it's cool. If it ain't, it ain't. And mm -hmm. initiating violence isn't consensual. So you can't do that and you, you can't do some other stuff. And then I think building from that, then I can put out, I wrote a book, uh, Harsh Advice for the Unemployed Guy, just trying to say, hey, here's a better way to live life and not be a lazy piece of crap. And so that was just kind of my gift to the world. Hey, here's how you can be better. My YouTube channels and even better yet, Odyssey, O-D-Y-S-E-E.com. Those channels are basically a gift to the world saying, hey, here's, here's just something I'm thinking of. Could be wrong, but I think this might help you live better. My Lutheran minister friend is saying, hey, here's some ideas. Here's a whole structure. I think if you live by this, you'll live a better life. And you are saying, hey, I'm thinking nature might be a cool way to go. Try this. You might live better. Is that mm -hmm. an accurate summary or yes my... and and i can't claim to be the only answer even if i think it is but why should i even if i do think it is i'm not nature isn't that funny i recognize my time and place so that even if i do think i have the answers i still can't claim that i do that's and and so many people they probably have another temptation of attachment to the idea of yes i need to have that one answer or i need to have it a simple one motto that will live my entire life Maybe it's much more than that. Maybe instead of limiting yourself, you realize there's a lot of different philosophies that everybody sort of lives by, and you have to put yourself in their shoes to realize that there, there's many different backgrounds people come from. I've met people who go through the jailing system, who did all sorts of bad things, you know? They actually end up sometimes where I end up, and I'm like, wait, we had totally two different paths. What happened? How did this happen? You know, so it's all about just questioning the world. So, uh, yeah, if you want to say it's it's to help people, I mean, that's the goal of education, is it not? It's mine. Yeah. yeah. I, I don't think it might have been Edward Bernays, but, <laughs> yeah, it, for me, it is. <laughs> yeah, well, I don't do think he is. was educating. He was propagating, you know, <laughs> propaganda. If you want to call this propaganda, sure. But I think there's a reason why we have the word education and propaganda and why they we, we have sometimes a nature of their own, basically. Hmm. <laughs> you know? Interesting. Well, what haven't I asked or what haven't we chatted about that we should? Um, I do. I would say that that first chapter of that Govern government is unnatural book is probably summarizing a lot of the concepts in naturosophy. Although, of course, you know, the main texts are going to have a bunch of scenarios, I'd say, um, like, obviously, that one focuses on government. But the other ones focus on every sort of scenario. I mean, there's even sections dedicated to different phrases when people say like, oh, well, what is this natural is not always good. Um, and I could actually bring that one up if you want, because yeah. that's like basically the appeal to nature. Yeah. <laughs> let's see. Yeah. Um, let's see. 
I have a section dedicated to it in my, oh, I'm in the wrong one. In uh, Sapiencia Natura, the original one, which again is not based on questions. So it's going to be better for like this type of interview thing. Okay, 181. I, I, the reason why I like books too, to be honest, is because it can word things better than I do in person. Like I may have been able to word things to you and I don't think I've made any too many flaws speaking to you, but the best part about writing books is you can get really clear as to what you're saying. And maybe you can understand that because you're an author too. <laughs> um, I'm going to disagree with you, man, because really? <laughs> spending an hour with you and I'm like, okay, I can kind of see this. <laughs> Okay. So this, this section, what's natural isn't always good, right? This is like a, a quote that this section is going to go over. And the answer is simply good, simply put good, you know, natural morality of natures. There's a section dedicated to natural morality. This statement claims to know the nature of what is natural or what is natural to the nature of the word natural. Isn't that funny, right? People who say, oh, well, you can't say what is natural is good. You're claiming to know the nature of what is natural. You're saying it's natural to say that what is natural is not good. And people don't see that they have an inherent contradiction in that phrase. And so I, I'd be interested to see what you have to say about that just right off the bat. Like, yeah, do you so see what I'm saying? Yes. And so are humans natural? Well, technically, under the context of the man-made and no, we're temporary beings, um, you can say we're natural to occur doesn't mean we're natural to exist in persistence because we only live a certain amount of time, right? So, um, so I, I think me as a thinking person using my structure, however good or bad it is, I, I can look at nature and, and I can say, okay, well, it's, it's as an example of nature would be the, the creek running down the hill the creek doesn't have a mind of its own. If I dam it up or I divert it, it's not like, oh, darn it, I intended to go here. It's not thinking that. Now, maybe if I come back in a million years, it will have broken through the dam or it will have, where it was diverted, it will have cut another shortcut and it's right back to where it originally was cutting a, a hole. But if I if I look at that kind of nature, um, and I, I guess I'm not understanding. I, I lost myself there, but I still wasn't understanding before I lost myself. Sure. Read that again, will you? Yes. So think of the phrase, right? What's natural isn't always good. That's what somebody would say if they agree with the appeal to nature fallacy. Am I correct before I move on? Yes. And okay. I would even say that I, I hold that opinion. Right. The reason this is the reason why I'm against this. Well, one of the main reasons, okay? And basically because it's a contradiction it's claiming to know what is not good <laughs> it's, yeah. it's claiming to, to say what is good yeah. so although they're saying what's natural isn't always good they're saying it's good to say what's natural isn't always good that I, i'm confused by going back and forth that many times but i would say that <laughs> as a thinking critter whether a horse or human or whatever i think humans can think better than horses uh, some humans I have subjective values and I can subjectively value a non-natural thing more than a natural thing. And so I get to put my subjective values on things. I get to say, you're wearing a blue shirt. I'm wearing a yellow shirt. Darn it. I should have chosen blue. Blue is better. That's my subjective opinion. So yeah, I get to say that's good. That's a, that's a gooder color than the, the yellow that I'm choosing to wear. Um, so yeah, I absolutely have that right. And I can, I can comment on a, color of shirts on nature mm -hmm. on religions Absolutely. is that not what the sentence is saying no so again when someone says what's natural isn't always good i'm saying that they're claiming to know what's natural when they claim that because they're saying it's a universal statement to say that the appeal to nature fallacy is a fallacy it, that it, it's that the fallacy is correct and therefore if it's correct they're claiming that it's natural because i equate the word good with natural Right. So it, they're contradicting themselves. <laughs> I don't see that. If you don't I see think it? lightning on my hilltop where I'm sitting is natural, I think that lightning is natural. And I, and my subjective value is continued life without being burned crisp. And then lightning strikes and burns me crisp. Then I'd say, oh, that was bad. And I'm not going to say nature had ill intent. I'm not going to say that I had a higher calling on that mountaintop than the lightning bolt did. 
but yeah, I think I can absolutely subjectively say, yep, that was bad. Yeah. And it was was natural. Yeah. It's not what I'm really saying though. So I'm just saying the phrase itself is claiming to know what is natural. (laughs) And this is why I know you do claim to know. Yeah. Like I claim lightning is, I don't know everything that's natural and I don't know everything that isn't. And I don't know that I'm right about what I think I know, but I'm, pretty sure that lightning is a natural phenomenon and also when people say isn't always they they give they open the door to say that it still is can be good in certain scenarios so like i would have to ask them what makes it good in certain scenarios and what makes it not good in other scenarios what makes them arbitrarily choose to say oh well it's better here good nature is good here but it's not good there subjective values so if lightning strikes 20 miles from me and starts a five acre fire and it burns. And then over the upcoming years, yeah, there's a little bit of erosion, but over the upcoming years, new vegetation grows up and it's overall good for the forest. Then I would say, yep, that lightning, I'm going to check that in the good category. The one that hit me and burned me crispy, that was a bad strike. Um, So yeah, I can subjectively say, I like that bit of nature. I didn't like this bit. I don't think they're inherently like one bit of nature isn't going to hell and the other to heaven but I can have my preferences, right? Yeah, I think what you're doing is you're applying it to a situation which I wasn't (laughs) trying to apply. I was trying to look at the phrase itself and people's own terminology because an appeal to nature is a phrase that people are saying based on different realities, um, scenarios like that. But it's, it's still claiming to know what is natural. They're still claiming to know what is good. So they're doing the appeal to nature. Well, the to appeal the appeal to nature, to nature is balance. essentially saying that people. I'm saying say, it's inescapable. <laughs> I don't get the iron or the the weird. It's inescapable. I'm saying that people who claim the appeal to nature is a fallacy are making that fallacy to the fallacy. <laughs> and I, I'm, I'm surprised people don't see this. Yeah, I don't see it at all because, I, as I understand the fallacy to be, it is watch out. And as with every fallacy, like the slippery slope fallacy, there are some things that progressively get worse and it is a slippery slope, but the fallacy is simply saying, Hey, watch out for this. Sometimes we people will say, Hey, this beer is made with all natural hops. Well, I don't like hoppy beer, but this is made with all natural barley. Well, how do I know that all natural barley is better than synthesized barley? So you said sometimes. Yeah. Oh, all fallacies are not concrete things that every single time somebody says okay nature okay so then then it's a little different because i i would argue that the reason why people use these fallacies or agree with them is because they want to say we shouldn't make any statements concerning Mm. what is natural is what is good and i'm saying we really shouldn't make any (laughs) yeah so it would just be if i say to you um this beer is good because it's made of all natural barley then you should say aha busted you are using the nature (laughs) fallacy now if i said this carrot is probably good for me because it's natural and i'm eating a certain quantity and i don't care if i have probably then yeah it's probably good (laughs) um probably is not enough knowledge my friend (laughs) yeah but it's something here you could argue hey you you drink a lot of that shepherd yes i do hey uh are, are you overweight at all yeah really overweight Hey, do you think that serves you well? No, it sucks. Mm. And so you have proven that, in fact, it was a fallacy that because this is all natural, it's mm, good. No, because now you brought it. You brought in a new dependency. You brought in the dependency of now consuming too much of that natural thing. So the thing is natural, but then you say, "Well, am I consuming it naturally?" Again, usage different from existence. When I said what is natural to exist is not what is natural to use, the thing is natural to exist Barley in that is. form. Yeah. Now it turned into the beer. Now it's not as natural. Now you consume it too much, not as natural as maybe, you know, less or as you need for your substance, you know, for your substance, for your nutrition, whatever. Right. So it's being able to look at all those layers. Okay. Right. So basically yeah, that, that sums yeah. up this, this section is because you, you even said sometimes so that's really cool because I just know that there's people online who are like, you can't ever make these statements. It's like, you can't ever? I'm sure you do within your life. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you have. Yeah, yeah, yeah. See, and I see the whole series I do on, on logical fallacies. I see them as a as a tool. That's good. And it's, and it's like if somebody says, I would tell a teenage girl that if a boy comes up and says, 
you're special. You're not like the other girls. Hey, gal, that's a warning. That's what dudes do to get in your pants. Now, is that dude necessarily trying to get in your pants this particular time? Maybe, maybe not. But just know there are a few catchphrases that guys are going to use and be aware of those. And then when you hear that, you're like, oh, wait a minute. Is he just doing this because he wants to use me and leave me? Or does he want the same thing I want, whether it's quickie or not? So I, I think it is just kind of a warning. Whoop, here's an alarm. Let's take a look. Oh, okay, that's cool. Or no, it's not. So yeah, I, I definitely don't think anybody should look at fallacies as a definitive all the time kind of thing. Okay, well, there you go. I think that kind of mentioned, you know, proves the point of what I'm trying to say, which is like, an appeal to nature fallacy is not always a fallacy. Um, and I think that's, that's a beautiful thing. So cool. Yeah. I would say that appealing to nature is not always a fallacy. Okay. There you go. And and that's basically the perspective that I said, okay, let's take that, turn it into a philosophy. And that's what I've done. <laughs> so okay. defining nature to say, defining what is good and, and being able to get really clear on that with knowledge. So, and, and you provided some case examples. So thank you for having this conversation. Like that's something when I first watched you, like I disagreed with you on a bunch of stuff and I'm like, he does not think using the same system I do. And I, I still think that, I think we have lots of areas that we would sit, we could have so many fun hours of argument. And when I say argument, I mean in a fun way that we're both trying to educate ourselves, just having fun going back and forth. Um, <laughs> but what I love about you is the way that you come off. You are so much nicer and more approachable. And I would encourage everyone, if you're a content producer in the open-minded space, be cool. Don't always be a jerk. Do some videos being a jerk because it's kind of funny, but overall be cool. Like it's possible for two people to disagree and to get on and hash it out, walk away, agreeing on some stuff, still disagreeing on others, still have a beer or a carrot or whatever later. And, and it's, it's all good. It's all groovy. It's all okay to to be different and have these arguments. So thank you for being cool about it and setting an awesome example. I appreciate that. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate it.